So welcome to uh, CS4510. I believe this is 6-1. And today we're going to talk about uh, the church. Turing uh, thesis. This is perhaps the top three most interesting lectures of the course. Uh, and it's a very important one as well. So what is the church Turing thesis? The Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about what we've done so far. Again, for like the eighth time. I've given you models of computers and I haven't really explained why I have. I've given you like a pushdown automata and then I didn't really justify why we have a pushdown automata. What we're trying to do is come up with a mathematical model of computation of literally something or someone computing and the uh, push down automaton doesn't really come from that or the dfa or any of these these were just sort of toys to to understand you know smaller models the turing machine does come from uh trying to understand computation so first let me tell you what the church turing thesis says uh uh, for any algorithm, computational process, uh, mechanical procedure, and so on. There's many ways you could define this. This is a sort of natural thing. Uh, there exists uh, an equivalent uh, Turing machine. So, first of all, this is a thesis. This is not a proof, and it's not something you can prove. In fact, I don't think, I think it's impossible to prove this. This comes from uh, empirical evidence and your own sort of naturalist understanding of what computation is anything that can be done by you and pen and paper can be done by a turing machine um so to give some history so church was uh let's see what i know about him he was at princeton for a very long time and um, he was a devout Christian, and then he moved to uh, UCLA, and he brought with him uh, all the logic that he was doing at the time. So he was a logician, and both him and Church were trying to prove the same problem. So he came up with this notion of uh, what he called effective uh, calc uh, ability, right? So what does that mean? It's like if something is effectively calculable, right? That was what he understood to be sort of a natural definition of computable. Um, he came up with lambda calculus, right? So he invented lambda calculus, and then he said, well, everything that should be computable, excuse me, everything that should be, quote unquote, eff effectively calculable should be co calculable by uh, lambda calculus. And he came up with calculus, and he, he solved a problem, a very important problem that was in 1936. Um, and we'll talk about what that problem is much later. Uh, but we will talk about it. And then Turing, uh, two months later, uh, came up with the idea of computable. He called it computable, and he came with Turing machines. Um, so in his paper in 19, he also published in 1936, but he published it two months after uh, Church did. So he, what happened was Church solved a problem, a very famous open problem in 1936. Then uh, Turing solved the same problem independently two months after Church did. And then he realized, okay, well, Church beat him to the press. And then he uh, added, uh, added, added on to his paper that uh, actually the two models of quote-unquote computation were equivalent. So Turing machines and uh, lambda calculi are equivalent in their power. Uh, so he, he, even though Church beat Turing to the uh, press, Turing's proof is like 
miles better. It the definition of a Turing machine is very intuitive and natural and mechanical even. But lambda calculus is sort of it's all this math and you know that's not as intuitive of a, of a picture that Turing presented. You know, not just was the contribution that he solved the open problem, but it was also the fact that he came up with the model of computation, which is natural and understanding. So what I'm going to do to you today is I'm going to present to you Turing's, uh, uh, what, what he calls the direct appeal to intuition. So uh, Turing came up with this idea and he has to justify to the reader why I mean, why anything that you, as a person with pen and paper, can compute can be computed uh, by a Turing machine? Like, why the definition uh, even makes sense? Like, where where is all where is all this stuff coming from? If you want, I, you can just go ahead and read his paper. It's thirty six pages, but it's not that bad. A lot of it is presented sort of informally to try and argue and convince you of his uh, thing. So this is uh, from on computable. Numbers. Uh, so the first thing he does is he uh, see. So I'm just going to copy and paste some sections uh, of the paper which I th and expand upon them. So computing is normally done by writing certain symbols on paper. We may suppose this paper is divided into squares like a child's arithmetic book. In elementary arithmetic, the two-dimensional character of the paper is sometimes used. But such a use is always avoidable, and I think that it will be agreed that the two-dimensional character of the paper is no essential of computation. I assume then that the com computation is carried out on a one dimensional paper, i.e. a tape divided into squares. So I have some pictures here. Let's see if we can shrink that down. I wouldn't draw these way too big. So what we have here is uh, like a boiling down of what computation was, right? So what we have here is a, there's a brain, it's making decisions. There's some sort of input system to the decision-making process, in this case, eyes, uh, there's a book. There's some sort of uh, memory not in the brain that's uh, acted upon. So there's also a little hand here that's like pointing at stuff, right? So Turing's observation, first of all, is that this book, whatever you write on, it's totally avoidable to uh, the geometry of the object you're writing on. So uh, if we if we were to take this sort of picture, we could replace it with uh, something that looks like this. Right, so these two pictures are equivalent, right? We've kept everything, but we have the, uh, instead of a book with lines and pages, we have a one-way infinite tape. Right, so... It, you could instead of writing your formulas or whatever as you go down a page you just keep going forever in one direction if you run out of paper you can always go get more so the fact that the infinite uh the tape is not true like truly infinite it's just quote unquote like enough it's big enough for any computation you may have to do you probably are not you're not going to use all the paper but you'll never run out of paper right so his next argument uh, I shall also suppose that we that the numbers the number of symbols which may be printed is finite if we were to allow an infinity of symbols then there would be symbols differing to an arbitrarily small extent there's a big asterisk here which I'm not going to elaborate on but uh, I could for an hour if you wanted me to the effect of this restriction of the numbers of symbols is not very serious. It is always possible to use sequences of symbols in the place of single symbols. Thus, an Arabic numeral, such as 17 or several nines, is normally treated as a single symbol. 
Similarly, in any European language, words are treated as single symbols. Chinese, however, attempts to have an innumerable infinity of symbols. I actually looked it up. Chinese has like 50,000 symbols, which is a lot, but it's technically finite. So, but you may understand that, again, the what he's saying here is that the choice of alphabet is finite. It doesn't matter. As long as the alphabet size is uh, finite, that's good enough. What he really says in this asterisk, he's like, okay, if you suppose you had like an infinite amount of symbols, uh, several of them would be very indistinguishable from each other, right? If you consider what kind of ways you could paint a cell, like the ways you could put a symbol on a square like this, a lot of them would look very similar if you had an infinitely many amount, and you wouldn't be able to tell them apart. So it's fine to, it's, it's, in fact, it's better to consider the, uh, the uh, finite, uh, finite alphabet, right? The behavior of the computer at any moment is determined by the symbols which he is observing and his state of mind, quote unquote, at that moment. We may suppose that there is a bound B to the number of symbols or squares which the computer can observe at one moment. If he wishes to observe more, he must use successive observations. This is actually extremely important. What Turing is saying here implicitly is that in a single step, the machine does no more than uh, a finite amount of work. Uh, so you can do our Turing machine model looks at one cell at a time, right? The hand is pointing to one cell, but he says, you know, you could look at B cells and it'd be fine. I don't care. That's true. You could look, read two words at the same time on a piece of paper and then act upon uh, what you see, but there is a bound. It's finite, uh, finitely many. So the way I have that is I have like a, I'm getting rid of the, the pointing hand here. And I'm just I'm just leaving it as a uh, as a, some sort of sticky tape, right? So there's a way that you can read to just as input. You just take as input uh, a finite amount of symbols, right? We will also suppose that the number of states of mind which need to be taken into account is finite. The reason uh, the reasons for this are of the, are of the same character as those which restrict the number of symbols. If we admitted the, an infinity of states of mind, some of them will be quote unquote arbitrarily close and will be confused. Again, the restriction is not one which seriously affects computation, since the use of more complicated states of mind can be avoided by writing more symbols on the tape. So what he's saying here is that the states are finite. The states of mine are finite. He justifies this in a totally different section of the paper by saying the justification lies in the fact that human memory is necessarily limited. And that's sort of uh, very difficult to reason about, but I, I suppose it makes sense because, you know, our brain is made of finitely, finite matter. It's, can we memorize an infinite amount of things? Pro probably not. Uh, if he also, if you justify here, if you think, if we had a Turing machine of infinitely many states, we could decide, like, everything. The What is computable and what possibly is not computable is very, uh, doesn't make any sense, right? Everything is then computable, and the study is, you know, we're lost. We may now construct a machine to do the work of this computer. To each state of mind, the computer corresponds and quote-unquote M configuration of the machine. The machine scans B squares corresponding to the B squares observed by the computer. In any move, the machine can change a symbol on a scan square or can change any one of the scan squares to another square distant, not more than L squares from one of the other scan squares. The move which is done and the succeeding configuration are determined by the scan symbol and the M configuration. So, there's a lot to unpack here. First is that um, the move which is done and the succeeding conversion are determined by the scan symbol and the M configuration. So the state of being of the Turing machine is uniquely determined by what is read and what is written in the state we're at. That is deterministic. A Turing machine, as defined by Alan Turing, is deterministic. We might we will talk about non-deterministic Turing machines later on, but the Turing machine, when I say Turing machine, I mean deterministic Turing machine, right? Uh, 
another thing is that you don't move you cannot jump arbitrarily far right this turns out is not so necessary but he's saying okay i'm only moving l square so in our model l is one uh b is one just to make things simpler but you could jump two squares in a single operation all that matters is that you go uh some finitely many squares and then so corresponding to the uh states of mind thing my picture my final picture of a turing machine it looks like this so what we have is we've sort of replaced the brain with some sort of states of mind in a way to transition between states of mind you may think about the analogy i made with the rabbit at the first dfa lecture um Right, so there's some input system we have, which is just a tape head reading. We have some one-way infinite tape, and we have uh, some states of mind. And this is what Alan Turing, his his argument for the definition of a Turing machine is why what it is. It comes from this very sort of philosophical definition of uh, what computation actually is. Like what happens when you sit down and you do a computation. Your brain switches between certain modes, you know. You need the paper. You need to be able to somehow have the input system. This is where the definition of a Turing machine comes from. And this is a very good argument for uh, the Church Turing thesis. This is uh, why we think, one of the many reasons why we believe that uh, the Turing machines are, anything that can be computed can be computed by a Turing machine. This is a very natural uh, definition. Turing's original definition of a Turing machine, he didn't call them Turing machines, he called them A-machines. It'd be weird to name something after yourself, but he didn't, it's not exactly as we presented it with the, the fact that the tape is one-way infinite and not two-way infinite or uh, with the states and things like this. His was slightly different, but the simplification we have of his definition, it, it, it maintains this uh, property. Okay, so this is Turing's argument uh, for the church Turing thesis. People have tried to do what Turing did, and then it turns out that everything is equivalent to what Turing did. So Turing's explanation is just the simplest one. But if you try and think, okay, this is going to be a computer, then it turns out it is, and you can do it by equivalence uh, to a Turing machine. To apply uh, the Church Turing thesis, what you do, what, there's two ways you can apply it, really. You can sort of say, if something is computable, then it's computable by a Turing machine, right? So if, uh, if uh, let's say M is any kind of computing machine, so any kind of automata, it's a sort of an informal definition. If M is any kind of computing machine, then, uh, the languages that can be decided by M are going to be a subset of the languages decided by a Turing machine. Always. There is nothing more powerful than a Turing machine. You could also say, uh, you could also word this as, uh, uh, there does not exist a computing machine I'll call it M again, uh, such that uh, the languages that can be decided by a Turing machine are a strict subset of uh, the languages decided by M. So there's nothing more powerful uh, than a Turing machine. The best part about the Church Turing thesis is that you don't have to reason about uh, formalization of the algorithm. So if, let's say you're doing a proof with an algorithm. If you say, well, this is an algorithm, I present it to you informally, like I scan this and I add that and I do whatever. You don't have to construct a Turing machine. You say by the church Turing thesis, there has to be a Turing machine for it because it's an algorithm. Then you can just reason about the power of that Turing machine. You know, you could say that, oh, if this is, if, if this kind of thing must exist, if this kind of algorithm is possible, even then there must exist a Turing machine for it. And then you can reason about that. So, uh, this is something which can't be proved, but it's a very useful tool. It's, it's uh, incredibly powerful. Okay, so I'm going to use the Church-Turing thesis in uh, a few proofs. 
from some simple roofs, but before I do that, I have to uh, build up one small thing. So uh, we say that uh, uh, an encoding, uh, this used to be called, and you may still see it called a Godel numbering. is a string uh, representation of uh, any uh, mathematical object. So not every object actually has an encoding, but most do. And we'll talk about the ones that don't. But you can think that, you know, for example, a graph can be represented by a string. This is a very natural idea. So uh, the encoding of object, uh, let's say G, is uh, denoted uh, by, uh, we, we use these brackets, G, right? So basically, we take the object and we say we just say we write it as a string. You have used a computer before, so this may be a very natural notion to you that you've done, I don't know, any kind of complex uh, objects. You've written programs that take input of a graph, maybe, and then the graph has to be represented somehow. Maybe it's a, like a struct in C, and then that itself can be put into RAM linearly. So this should be sort of intuitive uh, given you've used a computer before. For its time, though, so the Gödel numbering part was, it was uh, Gödel at the time, he, re way, he found a way to represent mathematical formulas as numbers, not strings, but numbers. And that was very unique uh, for its time because he hadn't had a computer. So it was interesting the way he was able to think about uh, objects that way. Encodings are not necessarily unique and they can be different. So there's multiple ways, for example, again with the graph analogy, there's multiple ways to represent a graph. It could give you a list of vertices and edges. A bad way to do it would I give you an adjacency matrix. If the graph is kind of sparse, then there'd be a lot of zeros in this matrix and the encoding would be extra long. But it's unambiguous what the graph is given the adjacency matrix or given the edges. You know, it's given the encoding, the encoding uniquely defines the object, right? We can take the encoding of multiple objects together, right? So I could do like uh, G1, uh, G2, and then I could write that like that. There's no problem with that. Similarly, uh, all the computers we've done so far, we've talked about, those all have encodings, right? I could take encodings of machines, right? Well, why do we care about this? This is very important because Turing machines take on Strings, only strings, right? They have to put that in the tape. So how do we, we let's say we want a Turing machine which determines if a graph has a cycle or something. It would, the Turing machine does not take on input a graph. It has to take an input a string. So what we do is we pass it the encoding of a graph and then there is some sort of uh, built into the Turing machine, there's some sort of translation about what parts of the vertices, what parts of the edges, and, and so on. So... This, if you see this notation, this is what this means. It means we sort of convert it to a string, right? So let's use the church Turing thesis in a few examples, right? So, um, let's do example one. Uh, there are infinite me many Turing machines. So, first of all, this should be obvious. Yeah, it's true, but I'm trying to do the proof using the Church Turing thesis. So, let uh, the uh, family of functions fi for uh, i equals 1 to infinity be 
uh, family of constant functions. Right, so what that means is that uh, we're all uh, x, f, i of x equals i. So basically it's like no matter what you put it in, it just gives you the same number every time, right? It doesn't even look at the input. This is naturally computable. You could come up with an algorithm for each fi, right? You just return i, right? So uh, by the uh, church Turing thesis, there exists a Turing machine for each fi. So each Turing, each function has a Turing machine because you can compute each of these functions. Each one of them has a Turing machine. So there's at least an infinite number of Turing machines. So we've shown some subset of all the Turing machines, which is infinite. So therefore, there's an infinite number of Turing machines. This is an easy idea. This is this is not like something that's important, but it's just a use of the of the of the uh, thing. Uh, example two. Uh, there exists a Turing machine to um, find, I don't know, roots of a polynomial. Right. So this is sort of, again, this is kind of easy. Since you can come up with an algorithm, Uh, by the church Turing thesis, uh, there must exist a Turing machine. Again, it's kind of it's kind of obvious. Uh, here's the whole point of me defining encodings. Uh, there exists. Uh, A Turing machine U, uh, which uh, I'll say instead of U, I'll call it uh, I'll call it a U T M, uh, which takes input uh, a string encoding of M and a word W, and uh, simulates. M on W. So what this means here is that uh, this is the universal Turing machine. UTM stands for universal Turing machine. It takes on input and encoding of a machine and a word. It runs the machine on the word and then it can do something. We can always just return whatever the machine returns. We could use that in some other program. We could, you know, combine things but this is a, it's only this, the existence of this machine follows from the church string thesis. Because if I give you M and W, you could come up with an algorithm to simulate M on W, right? You could actually go through and see, okay, I'm at this state. I have this much tape. This is what the tape is. I'm going to move left and then I'm going to right. And then I'm going to, this is my configuration now, right? Something like that. The actual details I don't care about. Of course, there should be some error checking, like M is actually a Turing machine, W is a word, the comma is there, you know, what? who cares, right? But this is, is possible by the Church Turing thesis. The existence of a universal Turing machine is actually, uh, it may be obvious to you uh, in two ways. One, you have a computer before. Computers are not, Turing machines are static and fixed, but, but a, a, a computer takes on arbitrary code and runs it. So it simulates all those programs, but it itself is different than the programs, right? That's like a sort of electrical kind of thing I don't want to get into. And the other thing is you may think that, well, there are there are uh, compilers, right? Compilers are programs which take on code and output other programs. So it's kind of like program for programs, right? 
th this is actually very important. Uh, and the point of this is just for you to know in the future whenever I say UTM, that means the existence of a uh, un the universal Turing machine, right? I could physically construct the universal Turing machine, but I, w I will choose not to.